Cool, so uh, super happy to be here. Uh, I endorse every, uh, everyone who previously were on stage saying how great it is to see people face to face. Um, so before we start, full disclosure, I've never seen a real air gap network in my life, but in my mind, it looks really just like in this picture. Um, so a small castle, isolated, cut off from the internet, and used to protect the most sensitive stuff. Um, top secret documents, power grids, maybe nuclear centrifuges. Um, and whenever we analyze a malware that is designed to attack such network, I'm not gonna lie, there's a little bit of adrenaline rush because we know we're looking at a tool that a threat actor uh, designed to attack something uh, of great value and something uh, that probably went unnoticed for too long. So, um, yeah, so I'm Alexi uh, with Facundo. We'll be talking about um, how threat actors have been attacking air gap networks uh, with malware specifically built to operate in these uh, very uh, restricted environments. And you'd think such malware would be pretty rare, right? Which is kind of true. But in 2020 alone, uh, four previously unknown uh, frameworks were uncovered. And that's what uh, prompted us to revisit that specific class of malware and put all the known uh, frameworks in perspective and see uh, how they work and if we could come up with uh, effective uh, methods to detect and to, uh, to prevent these frameworks for, from, from succeeding. Um, and we actually published a, a very thorough white paper on uh, our corporate blog, willivesecurity.com, just a few months ago. So all the details are there. And today we're going to uh, present to you uh, some of the highlights of, of that uh, research. And uh, so to do that, that study, we had to uh, come up with a definition of what constitutes a malware built to target air gap networks, because there are no real definitions out there, at least not from the technical uh, point of view. And so after a couple of weeks of back and forth, <laughs> Facundo and I agreed on that uh, specific definition. So we define it as a malware or a set of malware components acting together, so a framework, that implements an offline covert communication mechanism between an air-gapped system and the attacker. And we believe it all started a little over 15 years ago with the infamous uh, group called Sednit, also known as APT28, who uh, we believe developed and used a USB stealer as early as in 2005. And after that followed no less than 16 other frameworks developed by other threat actors, so for a grand total of 17. A few of those 17 have been attributed with a pretty high confidence to known threat actors, such as a Dark Hotel or a Mustang Panda. Um, but for the others, the attribution has been uh, less clear-cut or even uh, pretty controversial. Uh, but regardless, uh, we can state that all of them are the product of nation-state actors, hence the title of our research, 15 Years of Nation-State Efforts. And in our analysis, we studied all the existing reports, the pub public reports, uh, on those known frameworks and compared them on several properties with a focus on the ones that are uh, specifically relevant for uh, in uh, air-gapped networks environment, such as how does the malware get executed on the air gap side, and how does the malware establish a communication channel between the isolated systems and the attacker, which is the, uh, the how does the malware jump the air gap uh, per se. And for this, we formalized the anatomy of air gap networks, but from the malware operation perspective. And we came up with two distinct categories. We've got connected and offline frameworks. So let me show you how, how that works. So most of the frameworks belong to that first category, uh, connected, uh, connected ones. And those are built to provide fully remote end-to-end -end connectivity between, uh, over the internet between the attacker and the isolated systems. And so we'll consider a target network as having two sides separated with an air gap. So at the top, you've got the connected side. So those are uh, computer systems that have internet connectivity. And at the bottom, you've got the uh, air gap side where all the uh, systems cannot be reached from the internet. That's where the attacker really wants to get to. And that's a fairly typical setup, uh, at least so I've heard, um, because 
people working in these kind of environments, they still need a connected system to get their emails, browse the net, and that kind of stuff. Um, and that connected system will naturally be the point of entry uh, for the attacker to get inside that network. So now techniques used to gain access on that initial uh, connected system don't really differ from tra traditional attacks. It can be email-based, watering all attacks. Um, that's not really the in interesting part. What's interesting is the type of payload that will be deployed on that system. And one thing that that payload will do that is specific to air-gapped environment is it will wait for a USB drive to be plugged in the system and it will weaponize it just like a USB worm, actually. And that will mean uh, two things. First, it will copy the malware meant to be executed on the air gap side. And there will also be some sort of execution vector that will trigger the execution of the malware. It could be an exploit, a decoy documents, or something else. And Facundo will get into more details about that specific part uh, in just a few moments. And so then when the drive, the weaponized drive, gets inserted in the air gap system, that's when the execution vector will be triggered and the malware will be deployed. And that malware will usually uh, do uh, some automated stuff, like doing some reconnaissance, collecting information about the environment, the host environment, the network environment. It will collect files that uh, the attacker wants uh, a copy of. Uh, and it will store all that data in the, uh, on the USB drive in a very covert way. And that's where the data exfiltration from the air gap system happens. Um, and uh, again, uh, Faku will give you some, some pretty cool details about how that data gets copied on the drive and, and, uh, and uh, the various techniques so that this doesn't get det um, <clears throat> detected at all. But now the data leaving the air gap system onto the USB drive is one part, but the data still needs to reach the attacker, right? And for that, the drive needs to reach again the first infected system, the connected system. And the malware running there on top of weaponizing USB drives will also have code to recognize a, a drive that will contain that exfiltrated data. It will parse it and exfiltrate uh, the stolen data back to the internet. And all these steps uh, usually happen automatically in most of the 17 frameworks we, uh, we analyzed. Um, but other frameworks will have one layer of uh, additional uh, functionality and they will implement a, uh, a totally uh, independent protocol to allow the attacker to interactively exchange commands and responses with the air gap systems. And so in these cases, we'll see two different protocols. We'll, you'll have one protocol that goes over the internet between the attacker and the connected system and there will be a totally different protocol that goes over the USB drive to communicate between the uh, connected system and the uh, air gap ones. And uh, you could see the connected system as acting as a proxy between the attacker and the real systems of, of value here. In other rare cases, the attack scenario is, uh, actually doesn't involve any connected system at all. Uh, we call these offline frameworks, but I think of them as like mission impossible frameworks because in these cases, everything indicates the presence of an operator on the ground uh, that will uh, perform those critical actions, such as weaponizing the USB drive or uh, even physically carrying the drive and plug it in the target, the target systems and leave with the stolen data. And now I'll pass the mic to uh, Facundo, who will give you some, some pretty cool uh, details on the various TTPs that, that we observed. Thank you. So, as Alexis said, we focus on the malware properties that are specific to attacking the gap networks. We, divided, we have divided them in three broad categories, all the techniques used to execute the malicious code for the purpose of gaining a foothold in the network or conduct a reconnaissance of potential air gap systems. These categories are automated execution, non-automated execution unknowingly triggered, non-automated execution deliberately performed. So let's begin uh, with automated execution. Exploiting the remote execution vulnerabilities is the most effective technique to execute the malware. 
11 such vulnerabilities have been discovered and patched in the last decade, and only two have been confirmed to have used in the wild. The most uh, famous one is, without a doubt, uh, the Stuxnet LNK exploit, which only requires the user to view, to view a set of LNK files through the Windows Explorer to trigger the vulnerability. However, it was later discovered by Kaspersky researchers that a question group uh, funny malware had used the exploit even before Stuxnet since at least 2008. And even after Microsoft released a patch in 2010, Flame, Miniflame, uh, Gauss, Malwares continued to exploit it. But since the discovery of these malwares, no other exploit-based automated execution has ever been observed in the wild to compromise our gap networks. For the next category, we will take a step back from the complexity of uh, exploiting software vulnerabilities and focus instead on the human factor and deception tricks. In this scenario, the aim is to trick an unsuspecting user into executing the malicious code. We have observed three main techniques, uh, the, ab the abuse of Windows Auto Run and Auto Play in future, uh, decoy files to lure the potential victims, and reading existing files with malicious code. For example, Dark Hotel's retro malware uses uh, a tool that allows it to replace Word documents with RTF copies that contain an exploit that will launch uh, the, the Trojan on the machine. Now, at least five of the 17 frameworks have abused auto run or auto play in one way or another. USB Stiller and Agent BTC, as well as an earlier version of Stuxnet, that implemented an auto run file that contained both the executable and the auto run instructions. It disabled the auto play to force the user to go to the My Computer or use it or use the entry in the navigation of the Windows Explorer. And with the shell DLL command, it added an additional open command that disabled the auto play to force the user to, oh, sorry, set. An additional open command to the context menu that executed Stuxnet if the potential victim clicks clicks on it or double clicks on the drive shortcut. Now, Mustang Panda custom plugex malware uses a much simpler trick. It hides all the existing folders on the drive and creates an LNK files for each one pointing to the malicious executable on the recycle.bn folder. These techniques preserve the appearance of the clean drive. Just one second, please. Perhaps the techniques under this last category are the most puzzling. The analysis indicates that the attackers did not intend to trick an unsuspecting user into executing the malicious code. It appears that the concept for the mission was to have a human asset covertly execute the malicious components in the target network. Now, how do you think from a malware researcher perspective, we cannot identify such a scenario. Let's take the interesting case of USB culprit by the APT group CycleDeck, also known as uh, Goblin Panda. In this case, the code running on the connected side responsible for weaponizing the designated USB drives copies the malware meant for the air gap system in a hidden folder on the drive without any execution vector. So the analysis indicated that the only possible way for the malware to execute it is if someone knows exactly where to look for the malware and launch it manually. Now, in 2015, we discovered a malware on a mission. Oh, nice. 
<laughs> we call it USB diff. At the time, we could not attribute this sophisticated malware to any known groups. It wasn't until two years later, when the Vault 7 leaks occurred, that we began to think that the malware was part of the Lambert's APT. Now, uh, new funding f uh, helped us to narrow down the candidates to an implant codenamed uh, Margarita. The description of the system fits perfectly the scenario and the capabilities implemented by USB TIFF. Uh, the human asset, uh, let, let, let's call him Tom, to continue the Mission Impossible team, uh, will weaponize a USB drive and create the circumstance on the target machine in which he will have to see certain files on the Tom drive. He will launch Notepad++ uh, or Firefox or the true scripts, uh, and the software will launch, in turn silently, load the malware, and in the background, it prepare all the collected data for exfiltration. Now, finally, on that note, uh, getting the malware to be executed on the target is one part of the mission. The collected information needs a way to leave the air gap system and safely reach the attackers. We will now present what we consider some of the coolest ways the attackers have managed to achieve this goal. So, going back to 2008, Fanny is at the bar too high even for some of the most sophisticated malwares that were discovered later, but possibly developed around the same time and by groups with the same technical proficiency. Funny is what our colleagues from Kaspersky dubbed the USB backdoor. One of funny most interesting features is that it has the capability to create a hidden storage space in the USB drives that use the FAT file system. They achieve this by creating a directory entry with a combination of attributes that make it invalid for, for the Windows parser. So when the Windows finds such a case, the entry is ignored, essentially making the space invisible. This entry contains an offset used by Fanny to locate an allocated space of almost one megabyte in size, which contains the collected information as well as both commands and the result of executing those commands on the target machines, or the modules that the attacker would want to execute on the system to further augment their capabilities on the compromise system. It's also worth noting that Flame uh, used a similar trick by creating an entry with an invalid name that Windows will also ignore. This invalid name was for a, for a special file. Now, uh, Ramsey is a malware that we discovered in 2020 and attribute to Dark Hotel APT. The attackers came up with a decentralized way to spread the collected information about the system drives as well as the network and other removable drives. When Ramsey is injected into a process, it will hook the closed handle API, and when the hook is executed, it checks the extension of the file that was opened by the process. It is a word if it is a Word document, it will append a special container that encapsulates the collected compressed information. The same container is also append to every Word document found in, the, in any available drives. Ramsey follows the same philosophy to receive commands. It will look for other type of files which might potentially have an appended container with the instruction to execute certain modules or commands at a specific target machine based on a GUID that is in the container. All right, now, how to defend against those, those types of attacks? If you can remember just one thing from our talk is that it's always, always, always about USB drives. There has been no publicly uh, uh, reported cases of any other physical layer used to communicate across air gaps. Uh, no electromagnetic signals, no acoustic signals, nothing esoteric like that. It's always uh, via USB drives. 
So how to make it harder for attackers? Well, of course, disable USB ports on any systems where it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, that's going to greatly reduce the attack surface. Um, but uh, for the remaining systems where USB drives are, uh, have to uh, stay enabled, um, there's a way to implement policies in Windows to prevent file execution when they uh, come from, from removable drives. So that's one thing. Um, and there are also more complex uh, scenarios where you could deploy some sort of middle box where um, operators, legitimate users of these uh, networks would connect USB drives um, uh, back uh, whenever they would cross the air gap in any direction. And that machine would, for example, remove unwanted file types such as LNK uh, and autorun files. And uh, it could perform an anti-malware scan uh, as well. Of course, we don't really expect an attacker on the ground to follow that policy, um, but you can still put, on, uh, put some controls. Um, someone shared with me a, um, a technique that apparently is deployed uh, in different organizations where that uh, middle box would uh, also perform a, um, take a forensic uh, image of the drive and combined with some uh, proper logging on the, the other systems, uh, it would allow a sysadmin, for example, to spot uh, some, um, some USB drive that would have been inserted in a system without having been sanitized first, and they could uh, investigate further. So there are ways to, to, um, to at least detect some anomalies. Uh, now, uh, keeping air gap systems updated is also uh, something that could be interesting. Um, here we see the use of, of zero-day exploits uh, against uh, air gap systems. Uh, by different frameworks. So Stuxnet used an <laughs> impressive five uh, zero days. Um, Fanny and uh, Brutal Kangaroo, uh, two uh, each. Easy cheese, we're not sure if it was a zero day. Um, but in fact, uh, one days were uh, actually more popular. Um, that means that air gap networks got breached by, um, by exploitation of vulnerabilities for which um, uh, patches were available. The thing is that if um, apparently some, some sysadmins thinks that keeping an air gap, uh, a network air gapped will, uh, will protect against, uh, against attacks, but if the systems are unpatched, you've got some sort of like egg model where you've got a very strong outer shell, which is the air gap itself, but as soon as it breaks, well, you're, you end up with a, with a big mess. Um, so it's, not, it's really not ideal. Um, Challenges. So uh, just a few words on the challenges of analyzing that type of malware specifically. Um, not only because the malware is, is very, uh, are usually pretty uh, sophisticated and technically advanced, but it's also challenging because samples are hard to come by. Um, air gap systems don't always run endpoint protection, and if, even if they do, they probably don't have telemetry enabled where uh, incidents of, of, uh, of suspicious files would be reported to the vendor, and that creates a huge blind spot for, uh, for uh, security vendors like, like us. And at the same time, these attacks happen kind of by definition in very sensitive networks. So victims are very, very unlikely to share samples with external researchers, and even less likely to produce a public report of the incident and describe what happened. An example uh, of that is Ramsey, uh, as Facundo mentioned, uh, that's a malware we discovered in 2020. And the research started by spotting a trojanized 7-zip installer on VirusTotal. And we eventually, so we analyzed the file and we determined that it was a component meant to run on the air gap side uh, of a network. And uh, we um, started looking for the other component. So the one that would be running on a connected side, one that would parse the, the USB drives and look for that Ramsey container that Facundo mentioned before. Uh, and as you can see, that's an actual screenshot of our internal wiki. Uh, for two years, that, <laughs> that element has not been uh, fulfilled. We never found that corresponding sample that would, that would parse the, the actual com uh, containers. So, um, who knows, maybe we'll find that sample one day and we'll really understand how the attackers used uh, Ramsey in their attacks, but until now, well, we're not sure how everything really worked. So that's it for us, thank you for your attention, and if you ever come across some malware that you believe might be uh, built to target air gap networks, feel free to reach out. 
uh, we'll uh, assure you, uh, we assure that we'll uh, handle the samples with uh, the utmost uh, confidentiality. We'll honor any TLP designation you want to assign. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>